Hey, good morning. I was uh, losing my voice this week, Monday through Thursday. I thought you were going to have to listen to uh, the sermon presented by Barry White <laughs> this week. It would have gone something like this. Hey, baby. <laughs> Jesus loves you, baby. But Barry left the building, so uh, we're about 90% back. So hopefully I won't squeal, but um, you're, you're just stuck with me, not Barry, this morning. Last August 2021... At the elders meeting, I made a confession around the table. It was the first time in my life that I confessed this to the group of elders at a church. I confessed that I was burned out and I was emotionally spent. The previous 10 months um, leading up to August was very, they were very difficult months. It started in October. Susie was in a um, terrible car accident. Um, she was fine, um, but if the expedition had hit her side of the car, she was in a Prius C. If, she, if that expedition would have hit her car six inches to the left of where it did, she, it, she would have been killed. Um, but praise God, you know, besides getting extricated from the vehicle through the roof because the car was so messed up, she had no broken bones. Um, no internal injuries. It was just absolutely uh, amazing what God did to protect her. A couple months after that, though, Susie's mom had fallen in her house, and we got a call, and we went over to the house. And uh, as I began to start to pick her up, um, she was complaining about her arm, her shoulder hurting. So we called 911, and it was good that we let them um, transport her because she had broken her collarbone. Well, a month later, she was on the ground again, and Susie called me over there, and we couldn't even get her to walk to the truck. She was so weak. Called 911 again to transport her to the hospital, and this time, the x-rays revealed that there was some type of mass in her lungs. Well, shortly after that, she got better images um, done of the lungs, and she was diagnosed with stage 3 lung cancer. Well, being the one with the most flexible um, schedule and not knowing exactly what the expenses were going to be, you know, in, in my family, Susie's the breadwinner, um, so we had to protect that because we didn't know whether we were going to have to have long-term care for her mom, which we would have had to, to pick up the expenses for. So I volunteered to be the chauffeur to take her to all the doctor's appointments, which were greatly increased because now not only were there ortho appointments, but there was oncology and everything else in between. Four months later, Um, Susie's mom spent the last 10 days of her life in our home under hospice care. Well, after the family funeral services were held in our home, we began um, the all-new territory of liquidating an estate that we had never done before. Also, during that 10 months, I lost two um, of who I would classify as very close mentor friends um, that I had to participate in their funerals as well. And there was a lot of other stuff that was happening during that 10 month. And all, all those 10 months led to that particular Sunday morning confessing to the elders that I was burnt out. Well, the day after I confessed to the elders that I was burnt out, Susie and I received a phone call at 5.30 in the morning from our older daughter, Caitlin, who was living in Virginia at the time. I left 30 minutes later before that phone call had concluded for the first of two trips that I made to Virginia in a six-day period there and back. We moved our daughter and our two grandchildren, um, one at age three and one three-month-old, into our master bedroom, and Susie and I moved out of the master bedroom into the third bedroom. Six people, a three-year-old and a three-month-old in an 1,800-square-foot house three-bedroom, two-bath house. Very, very stressful. And I remember telling Susie midweek before the second trip up to Virginia, I told her, I said, I'm going to have a heart attack. I feel it. My blood pressure is up. If I don't reduce my stress, I think I'm going to have a heart attack. Well, at the next elders meeting in September, after four weeks of the elders asking what they could do for me and how they could help me, they provided the writing sabbatical Um, for the entire month of October, which I've mentioned to you before. 
And in addition to refueling myself by writing, because they knew that that's, that's how I roll, I was able to get some much needed rest and revitalization, experience renewal during that month, despite the fact that things were still absolutely crazy. The result of being smoked, the result of being burnt out for so long is that my weariness had placed intimacy with God and others in a prison cell. Rest is a key that was needed to unlock that cell door. Now, here's one of the life lessons I've learned, and maybe you've already learned this. Maybe this isn't new to you. But if we desire to have intimacy with God and each other, we have to actively seek times of rest and renewal because weariness slowly leads us away from everyone. Without rest, which includes sleep, but it's much deeper than that as you're going to hear from this message today, our mind, our body, and our spirit without rest, it will never be able to function based on the way God designed it to. Living in chaos mode, attempting just to survive, we'll be, we will become more and more unhealthy. And without the rest that Jesus provides, we end up leaning heavier and heavier upon ourselves. And what happens is we drift further and further into exhaustion. We drift further and further into frustration. Have you ever experienced the end of your rope when you were just about ready to lose it? Maybe you did lose it. Have you ever been burnt out, but you just, you just had to keep going? There was no other choice. Have you been in the state of mind where you were giving out what wasn't in the relational tank and you found yourself, you were deep into your emotional reserves? When you're weary and you're worn out, what's the impact on your relationships? I mean, do you tend to be more patient and more grace-filled when you're exhausted? I know I don't. I tend to be more grace-filled and filled with patience when I'm rested and I'm revitalized and refreshed. When we redline, when we tack out, we have a tendency to clear the room. We become difficult to live with and often we're left alone with our attitude. And the atmosphere is one where it beckons for others to really enter into that environment with serious contemplation of the consequences because there are times that tend to, these are times that tend to test the boundaries and push the buttons. So we've got to get replenished through rest and renewal before we severely damage all of our relationships. And that leads us to the question of how. Jesus said this in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. It's just a, such a simple sentence. He said, come to me. All who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What a simple statement from Jesus, and it contains what's needed to protect us. His provision can get us out of the deep pit of despair, his provision can get us out of the deep pit of weariness that can creep up on us on life. He offers a true solution. So we're going to examine this simple sentence, the three parts that make up this sentence, and we're going to, in the process, discover an oasis of renewal that it contains. The first statement phrase, first part of this phrase is simply this. Jesus says, come to me. And it's an intimate invitation. You've surely noticed that the greater someone rises in popularity, the greater that someone rises in prominence in this world, the less accessible they are to everyday people. You've noticed that. Security details are hired. Protection measures are increased. They restrict their availability and their access to common, ordinary people. They tend to create a very small and a very tight, encompassing circle that keeps them insulated from everyone else. But this is not how Jesus rolls. This is not Jesus. In fact, Jesus is the greatest person ever to walk this planet. And he's willing to be approached by anyone and everyone. The sick, the slave, the stray, the sinful, the shamed, the stupefied, the stranger, the simple, 
everyone. Jesus offers his invitation, this intimate invitation to the entirety of the entire world to come to him. He told everyone living in the universe and in every generation to seek him. Who does that? I mean, just think about that for a moment. For anyone else, that'd be totally and completely overwhelming. We, we would just be incapable to function, even to have a fraction of the world, say a millionth of the world, or just even just our own family members. If they all came to us at the same time, it'd probably spur an anxiety attack that we'd never recover from. But Jesus offers himself to the entirety of the globe. What an invitation. And inside that wonderful invitation is a personal choice. Every individual will inevitably make a decision about Jesus. Jesus is present. He's alive. He's available. But we have to choose him. And the choice is implied by the word come. Come to me. We have to spiritually go to Jesus. What does that mean? We have to yield our will. We have to yield to accept him. We have to accept what he offers and how he offers it. He's not going to infringe on your free will. He's not going to take your free will away. His life was given because of your free will, your freedom of choosing. That's why he gave his life. And so this means that each of us has to make the personal choice to embrace and accept Jesus. We've got to use our freedom to will ourselves to him. And the great news is, is that every person, every person has the ability to do just that. So there's an invitation, an intimate invitation. There's a personal choice. But inside that personal choice is a selection process. We can pick the Savior or we can pick a substitute. When Jesus said, come to me, we're made aware that there are other potential options that exist aren't there? Now, granted, these options are faulty. They're frail. They're filled with peril, but we still test them out, don't we? Haven't we all experienced selecting a substitute for trying to find rest? We pick a hobby. We throw in a hobby. This, this will be restful to, to take the, on this hobby. Or we select an individual or an immoral action or an addictive behavior. Something or someone else all in the pursuit of trying to discover rest. But that's what got us in trouble in the first place because we were a distant from Jesus. And it usually leads when we grab substitutes for Jesus, it usually leads to a pathway of sin. So it's the Savior we have to select for the Messiah, Jesus Christ. He actually knows how to get us to the destination that we so desperately need, and that's rest. The second part of the phrase of Jesus' statement, after he says, come to me, he says, all who labor and are heavy laden. It's universal in scope. Jesus said, come to me, all who labor and and are heavy laden. When Jesus says all, he means all. He doesn't mean some. He doesn't mean a few. He doesn't mean many. He doesn't mean the majority. He doesn't mean 95%. He doesn't mean 99.9%. He means 100% of everybody. The invitation is for everybody. And you might not think that God means you, but you'd be wrong. He means you. He means the person who's discounted. He means the person who's dismissed by the rest of the world. He means the immigrant. He means the criminal. He means the president. He means the guy who works, you know, at uh, Long John Silver's. He means the Republicans as the, and the Democrats and the independents and everyone else else. He means those who are stupefied and, and, and stuck in communism. He means the free world and the unfree world, third world country. He means everybody. He's including every single human being. The offer is for anyone who labors and is heavy laden. And so have you known anyone who isn't laboring at something? I've never met a single human being who is not laboring at something. Seriously, every single one of us, we have something. And so this offer is truly great, but guess what? Our God is greater, and he is able to deliver on this promise. Labor is universal. And is Jesus talking about, you know, just the normal workday and all the effort that it requires? Well, that would be included, 
But work is actually good for us, and it's connected to the God-given purpose. We're going to talk about work for six weeks over August and a couple weeks in September because it's that important. But a better understanding of what Jesus is talking about has to do with weariness. Weariness can come from a host of daily activities and routines. It can come from depression. It can come from health issues or medical issues. Weariness can come from our sin. And Jesus is saying, listen, if you are laboring underneath that kind of weariness, come to me. He's pleading, just come to me. I have what you need. In other words, he has the solution. But he doesn't stop there. He includes burden carrying, which is also a universal issue. Who who doesn't have some type of burden that we carry? If not on a daily basis, sometimes some of our burdens we're carrying on a minute by minute, hourly basis. And so this is something that affects all all of us. And, And don't you get overwhelmed at times? I know this week alone, there were at least Two times when Tim was totally overwhelmed. And I te- I'm trying to teach Maple not to use her proper name herself. She said, Maple this, Maple that. And I just did it with Tim, okay? But I was overwhelmed, you know? One time happened yesterday. I'm holding Tucker, and he decides to just puke, okay? Luckily, he was faced that way towards Nanny, towards Susie. And so between the second throw up and the third throw up, he got delivered to Susie, who ended up with it all over her for the second and the third. You talk about great timing for a preacher to have, that was great timing. And I, I'm just sitting there like, we, I mean, our house has been sick for like four weeks ever since the kids went to daycare. It's been nonstop. Every single one in the house right now is on antibiotics. I mean, we're not contagious. I mean, we're, we, we're all in antibiotics. But we're just, it's just a mess. And I'm like, you have got to be kidding me. I mean, what, when is it going to stop? There, there's just times in our lives when we're overwhelmed. All of us experience. It's a universal problem. Being heavy laden, it can include mental and physical and spiritual and any other aspect of life. And Jesus says this, if you're overwhelmed with life, come to me. Just come to me. I have what you need. And what is that? Rest. The third part of Jesus' sentence after he says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, he says this, I will give you rest rest doesn't that that just sound nice sounds amazing what kind of rest is jesus is jesus talking about i mean sleeping in on saturday morning is that what he's talking about no is it inactivity the the physical hustle and the bustle we're going to stop all that no that's not what he's talking about is it the removal of all of our responsibilities and the things that we have to get done on a day-to-day basis at work at home at school and, and you know in the community no he's not talking about that what is he talking about he's talking about peace he's talking about refreshment he's talking about revival he's talking about spiritual freedom he's talking about forgiveness he's talking about trust he's talking about the confidence that's fixed and settled because he is alive and he's available to help us that's what he's talking about and amazingly no matter what stage of life that you're in no matter what you've got going on that is available that is available right now for me for you for everyone the rest that jesus provides it directly impacts our intimacy with god as well as each other Now, I'm going to share several ways that Jesus provides rest. These are all deep. I don't have time to go into all of it, but I'm just going to throw it out there, and and you can think about them later. But there's at least five or six areas. For instance, Jesus provides rest from our choices. Do you realize how important that is? I mean, our life is largely based on the choices that we make, who we select for a spouse, when we decide to have children, am I going to graduate or am I going to quit, am I going to get that job, am I going to take that job, am I going to stay here? It's all about choices, largely. And Jesus helps us choose wisely. And wise choices bring rest. Wise choices impact our intimacy with God and others. But Jesus also provides rest from living under false, the weight of false standards. Now hear me. One of the reasons why I do not like the phrase, 
I am proud of you is because my standard for your life when I say that becomes the hidden focal point. You're not, my kids are not living for me. They are not living to make their mom and dad proud. They're living to please God, period. And when I tell my kids I'm proud of you, it's like my standard becomes their standard of living. And that's a false sense of expectation. Trying to live life up to those false standards leads to weariness. It leads to burden carrying. And Jesus helps us by his eternal standard because we are to live for the audience of one. Do you realize how much easier that is? It's a lot easier to live for him than for everyone else. But Jesus also provides rest during unexpected situations and circumstances. And I shared several of those unexpected circumstances with you in the introduction of this message. We all find ourselves sometimes in moments when we're paralyzed, when we're immobilized. It can happen in the doctor's office when they use the C word and they say, you have cancer, right? And, and you do, you're like, what? Okay, that's not supposed to happen. I, I didn't expect that. I mean, we, we'd already dealt with that. We'd already been down that road. It can happen when you're in the pastor's office. It can happen when you're in the, the boss's office. It can happen when you're at the teacher's desk. It can happen when you're caught in the midst of an embarrassing situation and you're like, God, I don't know how you're gonna get me out of this, but please help me. You see, Jesus helps us. We lean into him. He knows all of the complexities of every situation and every circumstance, and he is able to guide us through whatever it is we're going through we need to lean into him he says come to me come to me jesus also provides rest from our personal unrealistic goals and expectations now listen i'm not an advocate for laziness at all um one one of my daughters one time you know this is about 12 14 years ago she never made the mistake again she was trying to be funny and she called me lazy okay I went off like, and, and there was people in the house when it happened. And I mean, there is nothing about my life that is lazy. And she, we laugh about it now, but it was not funny because there is nothing about my life that is lazy. So when I say that we have unrealistic goals and expectations, it's because sometimes we're just so hard on ourselves. You know, we just have all these goals and these dreams and these expectations and we put so much pressure on ourselves and so much pressure on other people and all those standards and expectations, it can lead into a desert. We've got to become better at making his goals our own goals. What goal are we talking about? Like Philippians 3, 14. I press on toward the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I'm pressing heavenward. That's my goal. Jesus also provides rest from trusting in our own righteousness. Righteousness is right living, and none of us are any good at it. You know, it doesn't matter whether you're watching online or whether you're in the room. You're not good at right, right living. I'm not good at right living. We're, we're, we're great examples of what not to do. And so oftentimes we're trusting our own righteousness, but Jesus, he came, he lived a perfect life. He is righteous. And he said, it is finished. He lived a perfect life. And so we have to trust his righteousness as our own. We're never gonna be good enough to get into heaven on our own merits. And so we've gotta stop living like that's what we're trying to do and start trusting in Jesus. He completed it for us. He lived the perfect life. He made the perfect sacrifice for our sins and he's transferred his righteousness to us. Praise God, because we stink at it. You know, and lastly, Jesus provides rest from the internal civil war that rages between the old and the new self. You know, I've been a Christian for 47 years. July 4th, 1976 is when I was baptized. It was a Sunday. You know, when all the country was celebrating 200 years, that was my spiritual birthday. I was nine years old. I was baptized 47 years ago. Now, you would think... <laughs> I mean, after 47 years of being a Christian, you would think I'd be able to be better at it than I am. But there is a war that rages in me about that old self. When I became a Christian, when you became a Christian, you become a new creation. The new self has begun, praise God. But that old self still needs to be dealt with. That old self, even that, that nine-year-old old self, selfish, 
lie, manipulate. You know, even at nine years of age, okay, that old self likes to creep back up. And we have got to, when it creeps back up, we've got to continue to crucify it on the cross that we have to carry every day to follow Jesus. That's what we have to do. And he provides us rest from that internal war that rages between that sinful, selfish self and the new self that wants to be selfless and give and be generous and grace-filled and merciful and and peaceful and loving and kind and self-controlled. So how do, we do, how do we do this? I mean, how do we put a message like this into our lives? How, how do we make this work? Well, first, I want, to, I want you to ask yourself, are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you weary? And if you've answered yes, have you identified why? What's causing your weariness? Third, If you've identified what it is, have you brought the issue of weariness to Jesus and laid it at his feet? Now, listen, I know that sounds like a preacher statement, like, yeah, just bring it to Jesus. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the surface. I'm, I'm talking about bringing it to Jesus with depth of heart. I'm talking about with sincere pleading. I'm talking about maybe even with tears. Say, God, you know what? I'm, I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I'm worn out. My family needs me. I, I, things are out of control. I, I just don't know which way is which anymore. I don't know where to turn. I've, I've exhausted myself. Running over here, running over there. Being, taking responsibility, I'm exhausted. God, please, take the wheel, so to speak. I mean, just do what you can do. I can't do it anymore. If you haven't brought it to Jesus like that, with depth of heart, it's time to do that. I know that when we do that sometimes, we have to wait for an answer, (laughs) you know? And his delay is not very... It's not very fun because we want things solved right now, don't we? I mean, when we take it to Jesus and we just throw it down like that, we're like, God, I I want an answer now. I'm exhausted now. You need to. But his delay is perfect for his deliverance. And we, yes, we continue to do our part. We got to get up in the morning and we got to keep trucking on. But we've got to watch for God because his timing is always perfect. Even... I was talking to someone in in the atrium this morning about this, and and she was telling me about her life, and when she was going through all these different details, she's like, you know what, I just just didn't see it. but, But later on, I saw how God did all these things from a loss of a job to all kinds of family issues, and and then it was to prepare for this particular time when she was needed. And so she, she was appreciative of God, of how he worked out the timing of things. His timing is perfect. And so we just have to hang in there and persevere. Lastly, and I believe in the spiritual side of things, but I'm a practical person. I mean, t- tell me what I can do. How can I take my next step of faith? That, that to me is not just spiritual, but it's also practical. I, I want to know how to get on that faith road. And so here's the fourth side, and this is maybe where the rubber meets the road. What are you doing to build rest into your own personal schedule right now? What are you doing? Let's start from the surface and let's go a little deeper. Are you going to bed early enough to get enough sleep? I mean, that, that's important. Have you reduced your social media time? Have you reduced your exposure to the news? Want to feel better about your life? Turn the news off. <laughs> you know, you'll feel better. Have you found a quiet place to just have a few moments of stillness and quiet with God every day? When was the last time that you opened up your Bible and you just read for fun, for enjoyment? Now, I'm not talking about getting through the Bible in a year, which is great, and checking off those four chapters. I'm not talking about that because that's on my to-do list. I'm just talking about opening up the Bible and just enjoying it and just reading it with just for no other reason but for pleasure. When was the last time you you went on a prayer walk with Jesus as your best friend and you walked down the street and you just talked out loud to Jesus as as your best friend is walking with you and you're just talking about the things that are burdens in your life? How can you reduce the clamor and the noise 
that's in your life? How can you slow down and take stock of where you are physically and spiritually and mentally? You may need desperately, you may need rest. And help is available. Jesus is alive. And so he's here to help do exactly what he said. Come to me and I will give you rest. He said, come to me. Have you? I mean, Ellie and Brandon and Jerry and myself, I mean, we're, we're the elders, we're, we're here to help you, but we want to help you connect with the ultimate rest giver. The question is, will you? If you need to talk to someone because your life's just out of control and you feel like you're losing at everything and you're just drowning and nothing's right and you just, or you just need to talk to someone. I want you to reach out this week to us. We'll get back with you. We'll talk with you. We'll connect you with the ultimate rest giver. Now listen, I know from personal experience, listen, the last 10 months, if you know anything about the last 10 months, not the 10 months that I shared with you, but the other 10 months since, since all this happened, it hasn't been any easier. It's been more difficult. But I can tell you from personal experience that without rest, intimacy will always remain way over there. We need rest in our lives. And I pray that we're wise enough smart enough to go to Jesus and he said come to me